gospel according to Matthew. Glory Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore do not fear those who will oppose you, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak forth in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but who are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who is able to destroy both the body and the soul in Gihana. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground without the knowledge of your Father who is in heaven. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not be afraid. You are more valuable than many sparrows. Therefore, anyone who acknowledges me before the human authorities, that one I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before the human authorities, that one I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. My sisters and brothers, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
Be not afraid. Do not be afraid. This is something that whenever someone had an encounter with the divine, be it an angelic vision or a vision of God, these are the words that come from God to the individual who's having this very profound and overwhelming religious experience. It is also true in the life and ministry of Jesus. He is constantly telling his apostles to be not afraid. Even the resurrected Christ, when they saw him for the very first time back from the dead, even then, the resurrected Christ had to say to his disciples, fear not, do not be afraid. I have to ask, why is it that this commandment uh, shows up so frequently in Scripture? I think it shows up so often because it precisely speaks to the difficulty that we as human beings have to grapple with in this experience that we call life. The greatest problem that we have as human beings is that of fear. We are so afraid. In fact, there seems to be a persistent anxiety that's always there in our lives, even when we're having a good time, because when we're having a good time, we are experiencing an anxiety that this good time will soon pass. And so quite often, our actions and our lives are overshadowed, whether we know it consciously or not, by this deep, persistent anxiety this awful dread that seems to characterize much of human life. And indeed, it is well-founded because there is so much to be afraid of. The world we quickly discover as we're growing up as children is not as safe and secure as we thought. So there are many things that can go wrong. In fact, we even have sayings like, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. And so we are afraid. We're afraid that we're going to lose our jobs. We're afraid that uh, my spouse won't love me anymore. Or we're afraid of, uh, of being pulled over and given a traffic citation. Or we're afraid of being in an auto wreck. Or we're afraid that we'll go to the doctor and hear a terrible diagnosis about the state of our health. We, we are just creatures that are uh, inundated with all kinds of threats that our constant state of our souls is one of deep and persistent anxiety, and we repress that anxiety as much as we want, but still, it shows up. For me, it shows up in the middle of night, about two in the morning. Have you had that? Uh, I want to get a good night's sleep, and all of a sudden, I'm wide awake uh, in the middle of the night, and I find that my emotional state is one of anxiety. And for some reason, when I am in a place of sleeplessness, I don't have the strength to think through the, whatever is causing my anxiety. I'm just invaded with all those things, and my response is afraid, and then I can't go back to sleep. You've had that experience. So we are beset by fear. It's in view of this constant human experience that we hear the words of God, the divine words of heaven that speak and whisper within the depths of our hearts, be not afraid. Fear is a powerful emotion. It informs much of what we do. It is also something that we see from time to time, periodically, uh, manifest itself on a sociological level in society itself. In fact, there's something very contagious about fear. And so when things turn bad, maybe economically, oftentimes it was called a panic. And we have panic attacks when things go wrong and seem to threaten us. And so all of a sudden, the words of scripture that says, be not afraid, take on a kind of relevance for us, does it not? How could we not? Be afraid when there is so much really to be afraid of. To show you the power of fear, uh, in 1932 33, uh, two great uh, world leaders came on the stage of history. But these were two very different kinds of individuals. One was the 
chancellor of Germany, a man by the name of Adolf Hitler. You've heard of him. And the other was a president who was elected at the same year to lead our great country. And they were both living in fearful times. The world was engulfed by a collapse of the economic system that not only included our country, but affected every nation in the world, and people were afraid. Adolf Hitler used that fear. He fanned the flames of fear so that he could gain power through the false promise of being the one who could save the world. Franklin Roosevelt, thankfully, did not have that kind of attitude. He was a man of a different caliber, a man of a different character. And what he said upon his inauguration to the office of the President, United States presidency was this. He took a different tact altogether. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. A very different approach. Because Franklin Roosevelt recognized the enemy. And Adolf Hitler tried to mislead people in thinking that the enemy was something else. And so they went down two different paths, and you know the rest of the story. So fear is a very powerful reality that we experience in our lives. Now Jesus comes on the scene, and he speaks against fear in this reading that we have from the Gospel. Jesus was also informed by the experiences of his, uh, of his Jewish nation. He was a Jew. He knew the stories of the prophets. And in our first reading today, we're introduced to a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. How many have heard of Jeremiah? Jeremiah lived in a very fearful time in the history of Israel. Because he was living in the city of Jerusalem at a time in which the city was under siege by the vast armies of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians. And I don't know if we can fully appreciate the horror of being in a city under siege. This happens in the ancient world. You could build protective walls, you could build them high, you could build them thick so that they're impenetrable, but then the enemy army comes and they lay the city under siege. And there's very little fighting that goes on when a city's under siege, because what they do is they encamp and surround the city, not allowing anything to go in or anything to come out. And so, the, and it becomes a waiting game. And if you were a citizen in Jerusalem at that time, you might have had tons of food that was stored up and fortunately, Jerusalem had a, a constant source of water. Not all cities did, but Jerusalem did, thanks to the ingenuity of a past king named Hezekiah. And at this time in their history, it was a matter of time before they would run out of provisions. And then something happens to people's humanity when food run out. They eventually resort to cannibalism. And then when they've been weakened to such an extent, when they can no longer defend their city or have the will to fight, that's when the armies build the bulwarks and bring the battering ram and knock down the gates and scale the walls, and they utterly and completely destroy the city. It was during this time in which Jeremiah lived. He was a prophet of God in the city of Jerusalem. And like everyone else in Jerusalem, he was deeply afraid. But God gave Jeremiah a message. Tell my people to make peace with the Babylonians. Tell my people to agree to the Babylonians' demands. And the people and the ruling authorities in Jerusalem thought, no, we will not put our trust in the prophet Jeremiah and the word that comes from God, but rather we'll put our trust in our diplomacy as we've already sent messengers to the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, who will send an army to deliver us. Jeremiah the prophet, inspired by the spirit of prophecy, said the, that uh, Pharaoh will never come. And if you don't surrender, the city will be destroyed and everyone would be killed within it. That was a very unpopular message. And so they persecuted the prophet, one of their own countrymen. They saw him as a traitor. They ignored his word. And Jeremiah was not now not only afraid of the Babylonians, but he was afraid of his own people. As 
they sought to kill. The silence, this voice, this prophetic voice, which really was the voice of reason in these extraordinary situations. But when the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and people carried off and many people slaughtered, God preserved the prophet Jeremiah. Was Jeremiah happy about it? Read the book of Lamentations. He was depressed. That's why he's called the weeping prophet. I think he would have thought better that he was killed with the rest of them all than to witness the devastation of his beloved city that had happened long ago. Jeremiah was afraid. But Jeremiah was able to deal with that fear because God was with him. And it's in the spirit of Jeremiah the prophet that Jesus speaks to his disciples and he tells them not to be afraid. To fear not. For Jesus reveals to us the reason we do not have to be afraid. And the reason you do not have to be afraid, no matter how bad the circumstances in your life will become, is because you are not alone in your suffering. God is with you. God will ultimately preserve you, and God will save you. Why? Because God is merciful. God is compassionate, and God is loving. One of his disciples would later write, God is love. And the same disciple of Jesus would later on say, perfect love casts out all fear. Have you ever wondered why human beings do such terrible things to each other? I mean, we've achieved great accomplishments, our technology, our civilization, so much that we have done. But why is it that whenever we look at the news, we still see people doing petty things. People are still doing bad things to one another. Nations do bad things to one another. Individuals do bad things to one another. Why is it that we do these bad things and betray ourselves? Why do we treat each other in such hateful ways? And people will say oftentimes, well, because when people fail to love, they do hateful things. After all, is not hatred the opposite of love? No. Oh. Amen. Oh, good. That, that's my message this morning. Hatred is the perversion of love. It's the distortion and corruption of love. You notice this most acutely when there is a marriage that goes bad. Quite often what happens is that a couple who were deeply in love with one another and they promised their lives to each other come to a point in which the relationship is so deteriorated that they go through a separation and divorce. And yet, you'll notice something that happens to that deep, passionate love for one another. Many times, they develop a deep hatred for each other. You've seen this with some friends and some couples and that, this kind of thing. Because that intensity of love has been transformed or corrupted or mutated into hatred. The same intensity of feeling still holds that couple together. But rather than it being a feeling of love, it is a feeling of hatred and betrayal and bitterness. So they're really not divorced after all. <laughs> so love, hatred is the distortion of love. The opposite of love is fear. When we do not love, we become afraid. When we are not motivated by love, we are motivated by our fears. St. Paul tells us that this fear is the result of this kind of death that is spread over all reality. That is what he's saying in the second reading. And we are afraid as a species, Homo sapiens are afraid because of death. We are afraid because we are mortal. We are afraid of death. And out of our fear, it causes us to do all kinds of things because we turn against each other. How many have heard the folk singer Eliza Gilbertson? Anybody? Well, thank you, Craig. <laughs> That's the second <laughs> great star you did this morning, Craig. <laughs> Eliza Gilbertson wrote a song many years ago called Calling All Angels. Remember that song, Calling All Angels? Yeah. Great song, but there's, there's a couple lines in that song, and she's saying, we have fallen, referring to us collectively as humans. We're lost in the garden. 
And elsewhere, she says later on, we're lost in the garden and we're armed and we're dangerous. Out of fear, we have become dangerous. We as a species have developed an addiction to violence. We kill because we're afraid of being killed. We steal because we're afraid that we will be without. We do the kinds of bad things to one another because we are afraid. But Jesus calls us to a higher way. He reminds us that there is a God of love that loves us. And no matter what bad circumstances come your way, ultimately, God will preserve you. God will save you. Do not be afraid. Fear leads us into our baser selves. Love elevates us to the higher human potential that we all possess because we have the image of God within us. And when we really recognize God's love for us, when I realize that God loves and cares for me, it sets me free from my fear. But it doesn't merely just liberate me from my fear, it also empowers and sets me free to love others. If we really started loving each other in this world, then the things we fear most will become empty phantoms. And we would care for one another. And we would do what Jesus called us to do. And we would become what Jesus envisioned humanity to become. The divine image in the world. And we are called to love everything and everything. We are called to love the earth. We are called to love our fellow creatures. We're called to love one another. And in this, we begin to participate in that eternal quality that we call divinity. We become participants. So remember that Jesus taught us that your God and Father cares about you deeply. You're never alone. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. He knows every hair on your head. He's got them counted. For some of us, that's more than for others. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, God is deeply interested in you. And when you realize the intimate love that God has for you, this is the vision of Jesus, then we no longer have to be afraid. We will look upon the sparrows and know that God provides for them. Surely you are worth more than many sparrows. And God ultimately will care for you. For perfect love casts out all fear. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Amen.